is God. sustained observations of water mass exchange between the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea. This is work that's been carried out over a number of years uh, in a collaboration between Luke Rainville and myself at the Applied Physics Lab at the University of Washington, Priyatha Janadasa at the Ocean University of Sri Lanka, uh, Priya Anurul at the National Aquatic Research Agency, also in Sri Lanka, Joe Fernando at the University of Notre Dame, and Martha Wichiscara at the Naval Research Laboratory. And as usual with any effort like this, it's the result of the work of a, a large number of people, not all of whom are named up here on the author list. But in particular, I'd like to thank Jason Gobat, Benjo Keenan, Jeff Schilling, and the captain and crew of the Simon Draco, who were instrumental in making all this happen. And the results you're going to see today are uh, in review of JPO right now, in a manuscript led by Luke Granville and, uh, and with the rest of us as co-authors. So hopefully you will see that in print in a fairly short period of time. All this work was sponsored by the Office of Naval Research. So when we think about the area around Sri Lanka, it's, it's a critical region for the circulation between the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal. It's a choke point for exchange, right? A lot of the exchange of water masses between those two basins occurs across that region. The Arabian Sea is a evaporation basin, so you get high salinities in the Arabian Sea. Whereas the Bay of Bengal is a dilution basin, thanks to the river and input coming into the bay. And the exchange of water masses between those two basins keeps the salt balance between the, those two regions. It also has a strong impact on upper ocean structure, both in the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea. That upper ocean structure influence has influence on sea surface temperature, and that in turn feeds back to the monsoon. Right? It impacts how the monsoon evolves, uh, how it starts, right? how it unfolds over the course of the season. So if we look at surface circulation across these, these two regions, I've got six panels there, where the one in the upper left-hand corner is the northeast monsoon or the winter monsoon. The one directly below it is the summer monsoon. So December, January, and, uh, and then June, July in the red. And then the inner monsoon seasons are off to the right. And what we see in the blue arrows are circulation of fresh Bay of Bengal water moving into the Arabian Sea, moving westward. Um, typically around the, uh, around the southern tip of Sri Lanka, often very close to shore, but not always directly along the coast of Sri Lanka as it goes southward. Sometimes it comes, comes in from the, uh, from the eastern side of the Bay of Bengal. During the southwest monsoon, we see an inflow of Arabian seawater going into the Bay of Bengal. You see that marked by the red arrows, right? So again, this is uh, south of Sri Lanka, but often further offshore than the, uh, the fresh water that's going to the west. And that eastward flow can flow uh, directly, set, directly north up the coast of the Bay of Bengal, or more often it flows out of the central Bay of Bengal before turning north to circulate inward. So the questions that we had were, were questions of the vertical structure, right? What's the vertical structure here? What can hold the variability in these two areas? And really what modulates cross basin exchange in these regions? So we look at this picture. This is from a, a paper by Roman Stork from 2020, so a fairly recent paper, looking at the Southeast Arabian Sea Mini Warm Pool region. So that Mini Warm Pool region has been the subject of a great deal of research. A lot of it was done here in India. It's rural. So it's a place that we know is very rural. And the question is, what influences the stratification in that region? And what controls the breakdown of that area? So, what Heather did, she's plotted. In the color, and then surface circulation in the arrows that you see in those pictures. 
And therefore, in the left-hand column, a, a strong southwest monsoon. In the middle column, a weak southwest monsoon. In the, the right-hand column, a, a normal southwest monsoon. And they go uh, top to bottom, October, December, February, and April. So these are really focused on the uh, on the winter time period, right? During the northeast monsoon. And so what you see are fresh waters in the northern part of the Bay of Bengal, and on the eastern side, right? This is all the river inflow coming into the bay. And if you look at the uh, at the east coast of India, you see that fresh water kind of moving along the coast and southward, right? but not as continuous band particularly uh, early in the early in the winter and the fall. You see it coming down. And then you can see it intruding into the into the Arabian Sea along the southern tip of Sri Lanka, and then moving northward. If you stare at this plot a little more, you can see that there's actually a, there's fresh water not just coming around the top of the Bay of Bengal and flowing south, but fresh water is also cutting across the Bay of Bengal from the Andaman Sea. Right, so there there there's more than one pathway for that fresh water moving into the, the Arabian Sea, but it all passes south of Sri Lanka as it goes in. And what Heather's done here in the, in the right-hand column is she's looking at an Arabian Sea salinity budget, where the top panel is the, the surface freshwater flux. The next two panels are zonal invection and meridional invection. So east-west advection and north-south advection, and then treatment at the base of the mixed layer and the total. And the point here is if you look at the, the size of these various terms, it's pretty clear that during the winter, meridional invection is very important. Right, it plays a very, very strong role in bringing fresh water into the, into the Radiant Sea. And that, in turn, is going to have an impact on the formation of barrier layers, how SST evolves, and their erosion through the, uh, through the course of the spring and summer. Those, these are really the, uh, the drivers for why this, this area was, was fascinating to us, why we felt it was important to, set, to conduct a set of sustained day measurements. And, you, and these two cartoons are trying to illustrate the the main currents that we see are that we're worried about. The left-hand panel is the winter monsoon, northeast monsoon, and the right-hand panel is the southwest monsoon, the summertime. And again, the colors are sea surface salinity. Oh, sorry, sea surface temperature, a lot of former remote sensing. And you see uh, notional arrows for the, the main flows. And I'm going to try to use my mouse as a, a cursor, if you can see it. So here we've got the. This Indian coastal current, right, coming south along the along the east coast of India. During the northeast monsoon, we think that they may actually round the, the southern tip of Sri Lanka and bring fresh water directly from this pathway into the Arabian Sea. But at the same time, we see an you know, East Sri Lanka jet, right, so coming off in this direction and a pathway for water coming, coming further to the south. During the summer monsoon, we get the Sri Lanka dome setting up off, offshore of Sri Lanka. We have monsoon current that's carrying Arabian seawater from the Bay of Bengal into the, from the Arabian Sea into the Bay of Bengal westward. It's caught up in the Sri Lanka dome, right? So instead of coming directly up the coast of Sri Lanka, it comes up further offshore in the, into the Arabian Sea and so it keeps flowing off to the, uh, off to the east. And then the Sri Lanka Dome drives a southward flow. If you uh, pull the corner here, okay, there we go. Drives the southward flow along the uh, all the coast of Sri Lanka. So there you get a competition between flow moving southward driven by the Sri Lanka Dome and then flow that's being driven northward. You can see the dogs do so here in the mic. Yes, this is fun. Yes, yes. Okay. 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 So, the, the goals of the, the whole project were really to, to look at the, the variability of circulation around the, uh, around the coast of Sri Lanka, right? seeing that as a governing point for exchange flow, to try to understand the impact of that circulation on freshwater distribution in the two areas, and therefore on stratification. And then to see if we could characterize parts of the, the boundary layer, the mixed layer, that evolution through the end, through these measurements. What I'm going to talk about today is primarily the water mass exchange. So for the group that was here yesterday, we talked a lot about bladders. But since I don't know who's listening today, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about the vehicle that was used to collect these measurements. 
Uh, the observations you're going to see were collected by long water ladders. These are small Boeing Spirit vehicles, they're about 50 kilos of mass and two meters in length. They were designed for long endurance for missions of six months to, to over a year. All right, so to be at sea for a long time, collecting profiles of temperature and conductivity, dissolved oxygen, other parameters, as it moves up and down in the sawtooth pattern. The vehicle moves by changing buoyancy, so it's constant mass, variable volume. It changes its volume, so it becomes heavier than seawater and it sinks, which you see on the left hand side of that plot, right? The vehicle uh, makes itself denser, it sinks, it controls its attitude by shifting its battery packs around. And by controlling the vehicle attitude, it projects that vertical motion into the horizontal. So now it can move from place to place, right? We can direct it to go from waypoint to waypoint as it makes a sawtooth pattern up and down. When it gets a thousand meters, it changes its buoyancy again to become lighter in the surrounding seawater, so it starts to rise. And again, it's using its wings and its lifting body to squirt itself forward as it moves in the vertical. And by that, by doing that, it moves from waypoint to waypoint. When it's at the surface, it gets a GPS fix, so it geolocates, decides where it is, and it communicates home via an Iridium satellite telephone. By doing that, it brings in commands, new commands from shore, and it uploads all of its data back to shore. So we get the data in near real time with about a six hour delay. Very flexible logistics, uh, everything from rubber boats to research vessels to helicopters. In this case, we used a combination of the small research vessel in Sri Lanka, the Samadrika, and fishing boats, which are out, out of Sri Lanka. As I said, surface to 1,000 meters, roughly five kilometers of transit per dive, um, and at one dive every six hours, four dives a day. So we're moving uh, very slowly, about 20 kilometers a day, so it takes a long time to occupy these long sections you're going to see. Um, that has implications about how long it the sections. Um, right. So these are these are great vehicles for maintaining these long, persistent sections. And we use them to do this. So what you see here is, is Sri Lanka, obviously, in the map. And the yellow lines indicate repeat occupations of sections by gliders. And you can see that we occupy one section at 8 north, which we call the eastern section. And that was designed to look at the boundary current flowing on the south, on offshore of the coast of Sri Lanka. That was occupied between December 2013 and January of 2016. Uh, six glider missions, over 2,000 dives. Right? Um, that was a difficult section to occupy for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, operating that, in that region of Sri Lanka is a little harder than operating in the south. And so what you'll see is the, the, the temporal span of that occupation is, is marked. It's not, not as continuous as we would like it to be, but there are a number of sections. We'd intend to do both of these sections at the same time, but instead they ended up being done more or less serially. The southern section, which is along 80, 30 east, right, extending uh, past, down towards the equator, uh, is, was occupied between April 2016 to December 2019, uh, three plus years. 36 sections, right, and five missions. So immediately you see that the missions that are longer, right, the glider, each glider mission lasted a much longer period of time. And we have a, a much more thorough occupation of that, of that section. It's filled out through the monsoon cycle as well as over, over the, the course of the three years. We paused operations in 2020 due to the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, we just couldn't maintain this due to the travel and the travel restrictions and the, the risk to people of doing the operations during COVID, but we are currently preparing to get started again. So the idea is to resume, resume occupations of at least the southern section and perhaps the eastern section going forward, uh, hopefully within the next six months. So we, we talked earlier about the need for local collaboration and, uh, and local support in maintaining observations like this, and this is really no exception. Uh, we've relied on collaboration with both India and Sri Lanka to work in this region. Uh, in Sri Lanka, they've helped us with joint deployments of sea gliders in the boundary currents. And we've in turn run, we've gone training courses for NARA. We've also helped train the, the technicians for the San Madriga. And here, of course, we've had a long going exchange, both for science, right, understanding what the good science problems are, looking at data, learning how to run underway CTDs, gliders, et cetera. So, these are, uh, these are extremely important to, to us, at least. We couldn't really work in this region without the scientific understanding of the basis that's come before and without the, the help that we get 
and going forward and understand what to do. So these hop Mueller diagrams give you an idea of the temporal coverage that we, that we achieved. Um, in the upper right-hand side is the, the diagram for the eastern section. And there, time is in the vertical axis, and longitude is in the horizontal axis. Uh, plotted in the background is S-max salinity, right, where the warm colors are salty and the cooler colors are fresh. And in the dots are the, the occupations of gliders. So you can see, you can see the glider going back and forth from the coast of Sri Lanka offshore. And the dots are colored by salinity, so you can more or less see the correspondence between what the glider thinks the sea surface salinity is and what the satellite thought the sea surface salinity was. And then on the bottom, in the much longer plot, is the southern section. Same scheme, S map salinity and color, gliders plotted in dots. And what you see if you compare these two is that on the eastern section, we really had trouble getting gliders out during the monsoon. Right? We tend to have gliders out that are during the inter-monsoon and right at the start or the end of the northeast or the southwest monsoon, but nothing really in the part of the two monsoon periods. Whereas in the southern section, we have good coverage throughout. Right? We have observations during the monsoons, we have observations during the inter-monsoons, we have it over multiple years. Each section required about three weeks to complete, right? So the sections are not instantaneous, they're not even as fast as you could do them on the ship. So again, that requires some thinking about how one interprets them, the kinds of things we're doing here. I think we're on pretty solid ground, but for other, other questions that we might have, we'd have to consider how to, uh, how to deal with that. Okay, so to start with, let's look at the eastern section, which is here plotted in, uh, in the upper set of panels are salinities for the eastern section. Um, all, the, all the sections are plotted. In the bottom panel, northward geostrophic velocity, where reds are northward velocities and blues are southward velocities. The red circles mark northward or southwest monsoon periods, so northward transport of irradiant seawaters towards the Bay of Bengal in the eastern section. And the blue circles mark southward transport um, towards the Arabian Sea. So typically, Bay of Bengal water is moving southward going towards the towards Arabian Sea. So if you, you squint at this, I know it's, uh, it can be very difficult to see. What you'll, what you'll notice is that in the, uh, in particular in the blue circles, but in other periods as well, you get very fresh waters associated with the Bay of Bengal, right? In, a, in the surface layer, and they're often moving southward in that surface layer, and they're typically close to the coast of Sri Lanka, as opposed to being further offshore. The Arabian Sea waters, on the other hand, in the red circles, um, the salinity maximum is off the subsurface when you look at it. It's usually moving northward. Um, it's often further offshore than the coast of Sri Lanka, so more widespread. And we'll, we'll, look, at, we'll look at other other cuts of this will we'll make that a little bit clearer as we go forward. But I just wanted to have a picture of the, uh, of the of all the sections so you get an idea of what the, what the data look like to begin with. I should mention, this is just the upper 200 meters of the 1,000 meter profile, right? So here we're looking at the top top 20% of the uh, of glider profile. We can look at the same thing for the southern section. All right, there's a lot more data here. This is not all, all of the, uh, the sections. We're missing a few, but, uh, but most of the southern sections are represented here. And the scheme is the same. The, uh, the blue circles mark the northeast monsoon, and typically the, uh, the westward transport of Bay of Bengal water from the Bay of, Bay of Bengal into the Arabian Sea. The red circles mark the southwest monsoon, the southern, so the summer monsoon, and typically the eastward transport of Arabian Sea waters into the Bay of Bengal. So again, if we look at this, there are a few things that are apparent, right? The, uh, the Bay of Bengal waters, when they pass, are passing very close to the coast of Sri Lanka and the surface intensified. So you see the, the cooler colors in the upper panels are really closer to the coast typically. There are occasions when they spread out a bit further, but mostly they're more concentrated, as are the, the stronger westward velocities. Whereas if we look at the Arabian Sea waters, the, the darker red colors, those are spread out a little bit more. Across that, uh, across that section. They're more typically uh, subsurface intensified. So the saltiest waters are, are below the surface. And uh, the, 
eastward propagation, right? Eastward velocities is spread out over a, a larger region. If you look at that salinity structure, there's a lot of interleaving in the exchange, right? Lots of TS variability, lots of baroclinicity in the exchange flow. Um, and there are also instances where you see recirculations, right? So that the flow is not monotonic in one direction or the other at all times. So one nice thing about having a lot of sections like this is that we can make averages and we can start to make very sensible averages over different periods. Um, I'll say that for the southern section because we have enough sections to start to do averages. The eastern section is a little shakier for some of these periods. The averages for the winter monsoons are good. Uh, for the monsoon periods, less good because there are fewer sections, often only one going into the, uh, the quote unquote average. But what you see on the left hand side is the southern section, on the right hand side, the eastern section. The colors are salinity, upper 600 meters of the section plotted now. The white contours are potential density, and the black contours are velocity. And that's uh, eastward velocity in the left hand panel and northward velocity. On the right hand panel. The solid lines mark positive velocities, just drop velocities, and the dashed lines mark negative, just drop velocities. And then going down the middle, you see sea surface salinity uh, plotted for each of those two regions. Top panel is the northeast monsoon, or the top, the top row, northeast monsoon, followed by the spring winter monsoon, and then the southwest monsoon, the third, third row down, and then the, the autumn winter monsoon period on the bottom. So if we start with the, uh, let's start with the southward section this time. And again, the blues are marking the, uh, the, the northeast monsoon or the, the, the westward flow, the Bay of water into the Radiant Sea. And here you start to see this really clearly, right? If you look at the, the velocity contours, um, they're, they're a little obscured, and I know they're hard to see on the small screen. But you can see that the, the westward velocities are really concentrated off the coast of Sri Lanka. Right, the strongest directly off the coast, and the fresh waters are strongest there as well. Right, they're there during the northeast monsoon, they're there during the during the inter monsoon, reverses during the summer monsoon. Uh, but again, it goes back to being in westward during the in the other in the monsoon period. We can see the, the eastward transport of Arabian sea waters again during the southwest monsoon and the fall inter monsoon, circled in red there. And once again, even in the, in the average, you see that the subsurface limiting maximum, right? And a little bit of that intervening structure in that where you can see water transport. If we stare at the eastern section, um, again, it's a little shakier because there, there's less data to average here. But one striking thing you do see during the southwest monsoon, if you look at that third, third panel down, you see northward going Arabian seawater far offshore in the section. And then a return flow of fresher water and a little bit of Arabian seawater subsurface very close to the, the coast of Sri Lanka. And that's water being swirled around the Sri Lanka dome. All right, so in the middle of that, we've got the Eddy and the water's going northward on the east side of the Eddy and southward on the, on the west side of the Eddy. So next we can take a look at volume transports. Again, this is upper ocean. So now we're only looking at the upper 50 meters and 200 kilometers um, for the eastern section, the upper panel, and the southern section, and the, the lower panel. And the little, the little cartoons with the sea surface circulation. And the, and the arrows gives you an idea of what, what the, the general flow directions are during these, these four periods, right? Each of those panels, the tan bars, the tan stripes, mark the period of the summer monsoon, south, southwest monsoon, and the green stripe marks the period of the northeast monsoon and the winter monsoon. The, uh, the bars that you see, the, the red bars mark northward volume transport, the blue bars mark southward volume transport, and the gray bar, which is often obscured by the colored bars, is the net or the total volume transport. And then the dark black lines mark the, the average for that that seasonal period, right? So divided into the three seasons that we've, we've been working with throughout. So if we look at the eastern section first, the upper panel, right? As I said, we don't really have much data during the monsoons themselves, and you can see that really clearly now, because if you, you stare at that, you see there aren't many bars inside the tan or the green, 
green stripes, right? And mostly the edges of the green stripes on the middle, which means that the, the observations were mostly taken there in the winter monsoon seasons. But what you do see um, going into the, the northeast monsoon, right? We often see that that southward transport of Bay of Bengal water that we've been talking about, or we don't actually see that what's going on during the monsoon itself. And then coming out of the southwest monsoon into the inner monsoon period, we often see northward transport of Arabian sea water in the, in the volume transport. Yeah, and this is just volume transport over that that inner 200 kilometers of the section. So it's not a we're not looking at water masses yet for coastal transport. The southern section gives you a, a better picture of the annual cycle of the volume transport, right? So here you really see the sorts of things we 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 would expect to see. If you look at the summer monsoon, you see eastward trans eastward volume transport pretty consistently, right? Lots of red arrows going up. And if you look at the, the northeast monsoon and the green stripes, you typically see blue vet blue bars going going down. It's a westward transport of water from the from the Bay of Bay of Bengal into the Arabian Sea. Pretty clear pattern. Uh, the inner monsoons are marked by a bit more variability in the direction of volume transports. We can break that down and look at freshwater transport. And freshwater transport is a problematic quantity, right? And it's not a uh, it's not strictly a robust quantity to calculate unless you're doing it over a closed closed volume, which we're not here, right? So when you're when you're calculating it like this, it's very very, uh, very dependent on the reference that you can choose. Um, so I'll give you something that I think is more robust later in the talk, but right now this is freshwater transport with reference linearity as defined by our Roman stork in the 2020 paper. It's meant to just give you an idea of what the, roughly what we think freshwater is doing between basin to basin. And remember that a, um, uh, an eastward transport of high salinity water, right, is actually a positive freshwater transport. So it's, it's a slightly tricky thing to, to think about. So if we look at the eastern section, um, again, right, you see that we've got a, a positive freshwater transport in the uh, Sorry. So if we look at this, we've, we've got going out of the, uh, or sorry, going into the into the winter monsoon, right? We see the, the freshwater transport going from the, uh, I'm getting this mixed up. Let's start over again. If we look at the eastern section, right? And we look at the, uh, at the southwest monsoon, coming out of the southwest monsoon, which is really what we have resolved. Um, you see this this positive freshwater transport, right? So the red bar is going up, which we think is the uh, is the Arabian Sea water moving into the Bay of Bengal, and vice versa. If we look at the uh, northeast monsoon, right, the periods going into the northeast monsoon, we uh, we often see this this negative freshwater transport associated with the westward flood. We look at the, the southern section. Oh, sorry, associated with the south of flood. If we look at the southern section, right? Um, once again, if we, we look at the, the tan stripes, which is the southwest monsoon, uh, we get negative freshwater transport. And if we look at the, the green stripes, the, the winter monsoon, we also get negative freshwater transport, which is what you'd expect from. Arabian sea water being moved into the Bay of Bengal during the winter monsoon, or Bay of Bengal water moved into the Arabian Sea during that during the summer monsoon. So there are better ways to look at that in, in terms of water mass classes, and we'll, we'll, we'll take a more careful look at that in the, the slides to come. So we look at the, the structure of the volume transport, which is interesting. Um, here we're looking at the eastern section. And in the upper right-hand corner, we're looking at the, the structure of that volume transport is a function of those four seasons, right? Each each row is a one of the seasons, and it's plotted as a function of longitude. 
so you get a sense for, for where things are moving in that in longitude with, with more volume moving to the to the south along that along that section close to the coast of Sri Lanka and then a lot of the northward volume transport camping further offshore. We can look at section integrated transports as a function of time, right? So in the, the bottom panel, now we're, we're looking at the, the section integrated transports um, just plotted as, as month of the year, right? With all the sections plotted. So you see that there, there's a, a fair bit of variability, right? From, from, from section to section. But in general, during the, during the spring and the monsoon, we're looking at northward volume transport Coming out of the summer monsoon, we're still looking at mostly north of volume transport, but a, a bit of variability and more variability during the fall of the monsoon period. As I said, the, the southern, southern section is a little bit more clear. And here um, in the upper right hand corner, we're looking at seasonal average transports, but this time it's a function of depth to make the point that if we, we go and we look at the southern section, the volume transports reverse as a function of depth. Right, the transports at depth tend to be in the opposite direction of the transports in the surface layer. And if we look at section integrated transports, again, as a function of, of a month of the year, I'm now in, in depth bins. So upper 50 meters, 50 to 250, 250 to 500, and 500 to 1,000. Plotted, right? You see that the kinds of patterns that we, we more or less expect to see. You see, um, Westward transport during the, the northeast monsoon, eastward transport during the summer monsoon. Uh, section section variability is there certainly. Um, certainly during the inner monsoons, things are more variable. The shallow transports appear to be more driven by the reversing currents off the coast of Sri Lanka. Uh, the deeper transports show a little bit more variability. So this is um, what I'd like to get next is, is something that we've been thinking about for a while, which is a, a better way to think about freshwater transport, right? Since freshwater transport is ill-defined. And what's been done here is we're looking at uh, water mass classes. So we've divided, we've taken the we've taken the Argo data from from this this northern Indian Ocean region, Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal, uh, 2016 to 2019. So many many profiles. And we've defined three different water mass classes. Uh, class A1, which is the Arabian seawater. B1, which is the interior Bay of Bengal water, the very, very fresh Bay of Bengal water. And then B2, which is a more transitional Bay of Bengal water mass. So those are defined in the TS diagram on the left-hand side there, so you can see where they come from. We can look at the Argo profiles and see where those water masses sit within the bay from, uh, from Argo. If we look at B1, that interior water mass, right? It, it is as we want it to be. It's in the interior of the Bay of Bengal. It's at the surface. Um, the color of those those purple dots indicates the depth depth range of the, the water mass. Where the light colors are near the surface, and the darker colors are deeper. So you can see that B1, nor the Bay of Bengal, towards the surface. B2 is more widespread, right? You see it both in the northern Bay of Bengal and down through the Southern part of the Indian Ocean is starting to move over towards the Arabian Sea. Again, it's mostly at the surface. If you, you go south and towards the Arabian Sea, you find it slightly deeper. And then for the Arabian Sea water mass, you see it primarily in the Arabian Sea, but also over into the Bay of Bengal uh, and into the uh, southern region south of the Bay of Bengal. And strikingly, what you see if you it's it's near the surface in the Arabian Sea, although it's mixed. That as you move towards the Bay of Bengal, right, it, it goes to deeper layers. So it becomes a subsurface water mass in the Argo analysis. That gives you an idea of where these water masses sit. Now, the interesting part of this is to calculate the volume transport by water mass class, right? And we can do that by taking the, the map sections that we have, right? We have velocity and we have temperature and salinity. So for each cell, we can define a, a TS value. We can define this water mass class, and then we can apply the, the geostrophic velocity of that cell and sum them all up to get transports within the various water mass classes. So that's what's been done here. 
Um, the little diagram in the upper right hand corner is meant to give you an idea of where the uh, where the water mass classes work to remind you. But what you see is uh, along the eastern section, the water mass transports of water mass transports for water mass class B1, B2, and A1 in each row. Right, and the colors are meant to remind you of which water mass class you're looking at. And uh, upward bars indicate northward volume transports of that water mass class, and downward bars indicate southward transports of that water mass class. So what you see is that uh, the, the V1 water mass class, and as much as we see much volume transport of it at all, it's going southward, right? And again, at that, that one inter monsoon period that we have, have measured. The V2 water mass class, the transitional water mass class, varies a bit more. That's some northward transport, some southward transport, a bit of recirculation. And the Radian Sea water mass class is going northward at the end of the end. The end of the southwest monsoon. And again, each bar represents a section, so that gives you an idea of the variability section to section. We can look at the uh, the southern section again. More data, so so a little bit more allowed to look at. So again, B1, B2, and A1, each of the, the three figures. Uh, water mass class B1, the interior bay of Bengal water, is very definitely going southward during the northeast monsoon. Uh, you can see the volume transport of that water mass class very clearly now. B2 is largely going southward, but there's a little bit of variability during the inter monsoon periods. And then if we look at the radiant seawater, right, you've got southward volume, or sorry, mixing the south and west. So you've got B1 is, is going eastward, right? B2 is going going largely eastward as well, a little bit of westward during the inner monsoons. And then A1 is going uh, is going westward during the northeast monsoon, right? Eastward during the summer monsoon and during much of the inner monsoon seasons. But you see some recirculation at a rate see more in the last class. But that gives you a clearer idea of where the where the different water masses are going. It's probably a better measure of this than a than the freshwater transport is. Apologies for mixing my north and south and east and west there. So this is another attempt at summarizing that so you can get an idea of the, the spatial structure of those water mass transports. Um, let's start on the left-hand side. So each of those panels, again, represents the three, three seasons that we're looking at. Well, the upper left is the northeast monsoon. The one right below is the southwest monsoon. And then the two panels to the right are the inner monsoon periods. The open bars each indicate the, the water mass the volume transport of the water mass class, where the color indicates the water mass class, right in the direction indicates the direction of the transport. So the open bars indicate every section. And then the solid, the colored bars indicate the average over all the sections. And this is meant to give you an idea of the, the longitudinal or latitudinal structure of those transports. So let's start with the Northeast monsoon. Uh, if you stare at that, what you can see is we have off the coast of Sri Lanka, the Bay of Bengal water mass classes, they're all going north. But if you swing down to the, the southern southern section, uh, buried beneath the, the red bars, you can see blue bars close to the, the coast of Sri Lanka. And that's the Bay of Bengal water moving into the Arabian Sea, right off the coast of Sri Lanka, concentrated uh, fairly close to the coast. And then you see the red bars, which are radiant seawater moving back into the, the radiant sea. So if we go to the southwest monsoon, right, you can see the Sri Lanka dome is the really, really clear. Um, eddy. I'm try to use the cursor again. Kind of see this, this eddy right here, right? And that's driving, you can, you can see the, the radiant seawater mass class that's going northward, offshore of that eddy, right? These. Uh, these red bars here, and the Bay of Bengal water is going southward, close to the coast of Sri Lanka on the western side of the Eddy. If we drop down to the southern section, uh, you don't really see the, the Bay of Bengal water in this, but what you do see is that, uh, that eastward transport of Arabian seawater 
And this time it's, it's pretty widely spread over the section, so it, it, it just fairly far offshore in Sri Lanka. During the winter months, you just see a lot more variability, but generally you see Arabian sea water that's moving off to the off to the east, um, and you can see a bit of the Bay of Bengal water moving into the Arabian Sea. Along the southern section, uh, we, we've got in the, the right hand figure uh, the transports plowed by water mass class and season and depth. So where the, the top panel is the, the B1, the interior bay of Bengal water mass, the middle panel is the B2 water mass, the bottom panel is the Arabian Sea water mass. And the main point to make here is that if we if we look at the Bay of Bengal interior water, right, that's that's flowing in the surface there. When you see it moving, you see it moving during the winter monsoon and the, uh, the fall winter monsoon. The B2 water mass, you also see moving close to the surface. And that's also moving uh, towards the Bay of Bengal in the winter monsoon and the inter monsoon period. But it's moving in the opposite direction during the summer monsoon and the spring inter monsoon. And in the Arabian Sea, you see the, the Arabian Sea water mass primarily subsurface, right? The main volume transport of, of Arabian Sea water is, is below the surface as opposed to surface intensified. So to finish this off, um, what we see from, from these data, right, the exchanges between the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea are, are highly variable. The modulated by eddies, the modulated by equatorial circulation. The boundary currents around Sri Lanka are important. You can see that in the exchange flows we've, we've, we've captured with these repeat sections. And that both the subsurface and the surface flows are important. Right, so you, we don't get the whole picture just looking at surface velocity and sea surface slide. We actually need the, the profiles in the sections to understand the, understand the transports. From this, we think that the region south of Sri Lanka actually is one of the dominant pathways for Arabian Sea export into the Bay of Bengal and vice versa for fresh water coming into the, uh, into the Arabian Sea. So it's the mini warm pool. Um, this is in contrast to, to some, some more recent observations to suggest that suggest that more offshore pathways are, are the dominant ones. But this would suggest that these are, these are also important. And lastly, there's an operational lesson here, right? This is, uh, this is about six years worth of work to maintain these sections. And they would have been impossible to do without local support, right? To keep this sort of thing going for that long period of time. It has to be done locally. What I'd like to end with um, is this, which is the set of Ethan Sat Science questions that were raised during the, developed over three meetings really. Go a meeting here at Encoys in, in 2019, and then a meeting at IOT January 2020, right before the, uh, the pandemic shut us down. And I put these up here because I'm, I'm hoping that over the next day and a half, two days, right, we can begin talking about how we want to work together to make observations during EconSAP. Luke and I are really uh, excited about the prospects of making observations that might illustrate the evolution of the mini warm pool in the Arabian Sea and continuing these observations to illustrate the role of that exchange and that. But, uh, but really, it's, it's these, these science questions you have listed here that the group identified as the, uh, the dominant ones we wanted to go after. And these are, these are the physical questions. There's another set of biogeochemical questions, which I, I thought I would save when we would talk about this afternoon when we, we launched the biogeochemical bladder discussion. And with that, I'll stop and take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. Do you have any questions? Open the chat box. We'll take it from the audience from here, then we go to the YouTube. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question like, it's a like a very general question. How do you relate the dynamics to the profiles? And what? Because uh, in this, uh, this uh, yeah. southern can section. Go, can you go back to the slides? These are the southern chart of the slide section. Which one? The slide sections. The initial uh, figures. 
So you had a three eight six three dies, and the more dies were back, back up. So back again. What? Yeah. More back. Eight. Four. Backward slides. Yep. Yeah. Stop. Here, right. You have eight. Uh, you have three eight six three dies and eight thousand thirty four profiles. How do you like? Okay, we let them. There was some issue with the data or something. I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk outside. Okay. Here you go, there. Okay. Here we have 3863 dives, right? We have 8,034 profiles. So, how do you like this? Is there a problem with the data or something? Uh, what are we in there? Let's see here. In the dives for. So, for each dive, you have one profile or something? So, yeah, there's, there's, um, there's a discount there. So you consider what the you know, we consider here we're considering each each layer of diet profile. Okay, so one diet, one diet is one profile. So one one diet is two profiles, right? Yeah, that that's two profiles. That's that's probably a mix of okay. an older and a newer slide where I should be two. Okay, it should be twice. Yeah, yeah, that's what I can see the yeah, double the count. Yeah, double the count, right? Yeah, okay, that's fine. Yes. So you would say what would be the false false surface. Um, basically, we didn't want to take more than a few weeks to run the sections. So, in particular, with the eastern section, it would have been nice to go further out. And it would have been nice to go further towards the equator of the southern section, but it would have taken too much time. So, 200 was enough. That, that, so that link was enough to capture the main dam current close to Sri Lanka. But for instance, the eastern section, if you look at the bottom of the right, a lot of the rain and sea water, they, they see a lake of rain and sea water that's running offshore of where we stopped. And it would be nice to capture that. Um, but right, Bob didn't have permission to go into the Sri Lanka easy, so I missed the entire mountain current. But it did capture that, that offshore lake. We, we just didn't feel like we had time. If we had another line, we would have prepared that right to solve that problem, we would run two vehicles. Yeah, they were then managed to, to maintain the camera coverage. Sure. And extend that, that onshore section. Oh, what are we doing? Do you think we need to go to this? I just can't hear these guys. Yeah. Oh, can you just repeat the question there? And then, because others are listening from there. That okay, well, I can't hear the question. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So I can't ask yeah. the questions. <laughs> if anybody wants to ask, please come here and ask the questions. My question is over. The, oh, yeah. the 988 glider days over 1297 days. Right. Okay. Right. So, so, what is glider days and what is the other days? It's over the days. So, the, the 1297 is the span of the, the operation, so about three years. And the glider days are the number of, the number of operating days we have gliders in the water. So, so what, that, what that tells you is that the observations were not continuous, right? It was not a glider sampling every day of the year for three years. And you can see that in the Hoffman diagrams as well. Right? That there are gaps in the sampling when, when we either couldn't get a glider in the water quickly to replace the, the one that we we pulled out. Right, or there were issues that, that delayed us. Okay. How many glider you needed for one section uh, for the three year continuous uh, observation? Why not? Is if you have to plan such observation, right? How so, many you need for three years? So, for an operation like this, we usually figure that we need at least three vehicles for every vehicle that we're going to have operating. So, in this case, this would be six gliders to maintain two in the water. Um, if you're doing this locally, right? So that. That takes into account that it takes a long time to ship a glider from place to place. So it might it might take us months to get a glider back from Sri Lanka to get it out to Sri Lanka, which means that there's there's almost always a glider that's in transit somewhere. And then you've got a glider in the water and you've got one back in the lab and you're refurbishing. Um, you know, we, we have the advantage that we have a large number of vehicles, so it's 
we have we have spares that we can move into place if we we run into trouble. But the rule of thumb is at least three vehicles. Local, you might make it two. We operate off the coast of Washington. Uh, we maintain one continuous line off the Washington coast, and so we do that with two vehicles. Yeah, this kind of strategy will be very beneficial for the Indian coast as well, uh, because we also have a strong uh, EICC and WICC, right. Western Boundary Current and Eastern Boundary Current. Uh, but they are mainly uh, observed by these ADCP moorings. Uh, we have an area of ADCP moorings mm -hmm. around the west coast and east coast, but they are point location. Uh, but this kind of observations can give uh, how the spatial heat is varying right. from the shelf to this shelf. Yeah, the, the gliders are really good at doing that, that kind of thing. So you, you're you looking for phenomena that have variability on time scales of weeks, right? Weeks or a, a month or two. These gliders are slow, right? So they can capture that. Um, they're good at capturing the structure of the current. What you see here is you, you can do pretty good estimates of water mass transports. Right, so have a, have a pretty good idea of, of salt flux between basins at those time scales. Uh, I have one more question. See, uh, for this case, uh, the operation is a little bit uh, straightforward in the sense that uh, the depth is more than 1,000 meters across your section. Uh, but you must have done similar experiment for the, uh, the U.S. coast or somewhere else where you have a shelf. So how do you actually uh, uh, modify the operation? So you manually change the depth or uh, you actually allow the glider to detect the depth and then uh, do the operation? So the glider carries a back measure chart. So it knows, it predicts what the depth is going to be on this next dive. And then it has an altimeter. And we ask it to, to ping when it gets close to, to where its predicted depth is. And then it will turn around if it senses the bottom prior to that, prior to that depth. It's basically automation. So right. yeah, you don't interfere manually. No, no it's all. The, the, manual, the manual part of it is making the bathymetric chart that you give to the glider. Right? So the, its ability to, to do this is only as good as that chart that you give it. And then what sorts of thresholds you set for when it's going to start paying, when it uses its altimeter, right? And when it's going to turn around. Okay, uh, I'm going to take some one way question. There's one question, why freshwater transport is missing in 2013, 15 and 16 along the eastern section? It shows only in uh, 2014. Uh, let's see. And go back to this slide. You looking at that? Okay. Uh, there's no transports because there's no data. <laughs> there's no data. Yeah. So if you, if you look at if you look at this, you can see where there's data, right? Can, can, you hold, can you hold a second? In the YouTube, it takes three to five seconds to reach that. Uh, Change the slide. Yes, slides. Right. So if you if you look at the upper right hand plot there, the Hopmiller diagram, the dots represent the places where there's glider data, and there is a massive gap in uh, sort of that 2000, 2015, 2014. So, so you mean to say there was no glider data 2013, 15, and uh, 16? It's a missing data. Right. Yeah. No data from 15. And very, there's no data in the first half of 2015. I think there is a, one more uh, similar question. Uh, very interesting to uh, quantify the volume transport across the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea. Why there is why there is so much of gap in the eastern section for the volume transport? Uh, because we couldn't get ships to take us out. Okay. Right. We, it was difficult to operate consistently mm -hmm. off the east coast of Sri Lanka. It might be different if we went back and tried to do it again now, but at that time it was our, our Sri Lankan colleagues were doing their best to help us get vehicles in and out of the water. But, but that was not an easy section to maintain. Okay. So, 
Thank you. Thank you all. Is there any other questions? Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your